Hey, stranger. <laughs> What's happening? Ah, uh, you know. Thank you, that. by the way, for your donation this week. Oh, you, okay, good. You got it. Yeah. I was informed of that uh, on, uh, I think it was Monday. Do they call you or you have Monday to go there? Hey? Do they call you to let you know or they do, or you, just, you just go there and find out? Oh, I happen to be there. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yep. Did you uh, return to work? Good. Uh, yeah. From when? When did I? No Ebola in your house? <laughs> <laughs> no Ebola. We're Ebola free. Right. <laughs> You're Ebola free. That's good. <laughs> How about Jerd? I know he called once about a week or so ago. I was uh, in my usual place, covered in clay and mud up to the ears, and <laughs> dig- digging uh, underneath the house. Any uh, new discoveries down there? Yeah. Um not quite sure what to make of it all yet, but um, in um, in following uh, evidence that uh, is in the house but not known to many to be basically a code, um, I decided on a um, an entry point under the house uh, up until recently i had in fact been uh, only dealing in the outside of the uh, foundation right. i decided it was time to uh, penetrate if i got this coded information right it was time to penetrate under the house hoping the whole thing wouldn't collapse on me. Um, (laughs) And uh, I did so, and in my journey, which traveled um, approximately 10 feet from the outer walls of the house, um, I um, encountered some uh, uh, granite-type rocks with um, um, white marbleish inserts into it shaped in the form of one could say a skull or or a foot print um, and other such things along the way that gave me a hint I was heading in the right direction. At about um, a depth of uh, four to five feet, um, my hole had extended about nine or ten feet under the house, being careful to create situations where there would be support for the floor above. Um, A number of uh, uh, stones, fairly uh, large stones, I'd say basketball size, a little bigger than basketball, uh, some football size, a little bigger than a football, but general shape, um, have markings in them that um, um, show different materials um, making images on the outside of the stone 
and other uh, rocks uh, that I happened to break uh, while I was making my way, having no sign of anything on the outside, but having uh, different colored material on the inside, and it's usually white, this material, but not necessarily white. There are two things that could be uh, described as turtle shape. Mm -hmm. the, these turtle shapes could be, in fact, based on Turtle Island, North America, or it could be um, Antarctica or Australia at a time when the water was lower and therefore there would be a link out from the rounder shape in the middle uh, in what appears to be a neck or a head sticking out to, say, New Zealand or Tasmania, right. that kind of uh, activity. Now, some of the rock found, and especially uh, white stuff, uh, seems to be of basalt origin. Basalt is usually a, a blackish rock, right. but, but there is a derivative of basalt, which is white. Both of them would suggest um, that they originate at a place near the center of the earth um, and uh, uh, were, were brought up during some kind of uh, volcano activity sometime in the past or brought and deposited there for a purpose. Now, in the place that I entered, there was a patio stone um, below the window on the south side of the house, which if you recall, um, south side would be on the garage side, and the old burnt out foundation of a house that existed probably a hundred years ago that side there is facing the US the south side okay. and and uh, this patio stone obviously handmade about four feet by four feet uh, in size very heavy um had, when I got under it and started looking up at it, um, a, um, a bunch of items that I could see were in place within the rock and might have some kind of significance if I got to see it properly. I have, of course, placed signs at the front of the house that Ontario Hydro is um, killing people uh, by creating a uh, magnetic field uh, by the method they use for grounding underneath uh, a house uh, instead of a lightning rod uh, on the roof of the house they've now converted to a grounding of the electrical system in the house which basically if you understand grounding and lightning and the electromagnet activity was put in not only to send surplus electricity out of the house if there happens to be a, a, a 
jolt in the amount of electricity that comes from the wires above into the ground, but also returning electromagnetic electricity from the ground into the house via the hydro network and what's most important for magnetism, it's connected to the telephone lines. Right. Telephone lines require much finer wiring than electrical lines. And magnetism requires that type of um, uh, wire, if you will, almost like a filament rather than a wire. Right. Now, at one stage of the game, the people across the street are reading my signs every day, um, showed up with a bunch of heavy equipment and included in that were back holes and stuff. And they dug out all of the foundation around their house. Uh, and while they were doing it, Jennifer overheard one guy said, how do we get that out of there? And the answer was, um, uh, we can always pull it out with some of the heavier equipment. And all of this was being done kind of in secret. And everything that came out from under their house was put into a dumpster and taken away. And they rebuilt the entire foundation with new concrete blocks uh, all around the house. Really? So there must have been something, and these are the, uh, I don't know if you remember, the Gore? family of the street, Gorel. Gorel, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Gorel, which is linked to the word gore, which is, you know, uh, a triangle and, and very important in a three-in-one coding type of what, structure. What is your and, sign and they're both uh, they're both hydrologists. Oh, yeah. German. In background, hydrologist in education, and there they are getting their whole foundation replaced. Because so they they basically they know you're doing yours or digging, and then they decided to copy you and replace it. Yeah, and they may have had something underneath their house that linked both properties, uh, because water comes to our place from their place and from our place further down to the creek that's the slant of the land and there being a a rock formation 23 feet down it means the water table is running in a 23 foot area uh, and is slanted towards the creek so anything in their house uh, would be running past them and then into us. And the fact that people lived in this house before and died, and one of the girls lives next door now, had a, a child um, who uh, has a... a disabled um, handicap, mental handicap, mm -hmm. and so do the Gorels, suggests that something in common. Now, a magnetic field, if you read uh, Michael Faraday, going back to the 1800s, right. talks yeah. about all of the physical and mental problems that came to him and people around him due to his experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, just being close to a magnetic field um, acts like a magnet on the cells of the body. 
and attracts them and causes changes to the the structure of of the cells the the neurons which basically operate on a very filament like nerve structure drag down towards this this magnetic pull, if you will, causing things like depression, uh, and these are all things over time, um, can cause mental uh, illness, can cause um, heart or lung problems because of clotting of the blood um, can cause fat bottom ladies you know the the pulling on everything towards the floor would explain how a normal shape woman by the time of 27 or so ends up being very fat bottom and many of those are found in Africa, where all of this probably began. Uh, in uh, my particular case, over a five-year period of sleeping in the basement, I developed a hernia, which is basically pulling things that would normally be located in the stomach down into the scrotum, and I have seen um, uh, in a museum in Israel um, a statue that resembles what I have, uh, where um, it's model of a, a man with. Uh, a bag that extends almost down to the middle on the way to the knees, uh, which is the result of a hernia, a breaking of something within the stomach and the uh, inability of the muscle structure to hang on to it in the stomach pulls it down into the scrotum. Uh, So, with all of this health problem possible, I needed to investigate, first of all, if it existed underneath the house and what it might do to us if it wasn't repaired. Now... Most people wouldn't make the connection, but the um, uh, treasures of the Temple of Jerusalem included for a time a, um, a box that was described as the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant Uh, could not be touched directly, had to be carried by four people with two long poles, so they were away from it. And top of the box is supposed to be two wings of which something that wiggles jumps across, and they refer to it as a snake, but it's in fact an electromagnet, and what jumps across is electricity. And that, of course, was in a period in time between 1000 B.C. and 586 B.C. when there was a revolt and the people were uh, evicted from, from Israel and sent all over the world. But at a period in time of the Crusades, the Vatican got control of 
the area and more than likely uh, had control of that kind of uh, box. Some people say it was taken to Africa. Other people say it was taken to different places in Europe where every place it went, they were then involved in war and and were basically their economies were destroyed and everything to a point where nobody wanted anything to do with this box. And they returned it to Israel, if that story is correct, where it disappeared. Um, and the likely disappearance would have resulted in the Crusades fighting a war against the infidels while the treasure was being taken out of Israel and brought uh, to Spain originally, then to Wales in Great Britain, and then across the ocean and uh, uh, hidden someplace. Uh, People will say Oak Island is one possibility uh, off the coast of Nova Scotia. Other people have all kinds of locations. Um, The cell believes that the, uh, the Vikings, during that period in time, about 1000 to 1100 uh, A.D., um, were mercenaries, and they were for hire. And while the priests were learning lessons in Israel, the nuns were stealing the stuff for future use, And everybody paying attention to what's happening to the east, the nuns got the Vikings to bring the treasure to North America. And the men were sent to investigate the Great Lakes while the women in the family were remaining someplace behind. Now, the men got all the way up to Lake of the Woods and uh, Lake Superior and all of that region. That's why Minnesota's football team is called the Vikings. Uh They worked out a plan for the destruction of North America once its task, specific purpose of the gene pools being sent over here would be completed. That time has now arrived, and the loo at the Sioux is what they worked out. While the women remain further east of the Great Lakes, on a place they knew would be secure, because of isostasy uh, and the rising of the Canadian shield uh, would protect them from what would happen to most people if all you worry about is a flood. Mind you, there are three things to worry about when you have a flood such as the Lou at the Sioux, the first, of course, is the water that will make a fish stoop, a mess of potage, the Bible describes it as. Uh-huh. Second thing that happens is along with water coming uh, onto the ground and out of the ground is um, um, radon gas, 
although not able to kill you in the instant uh, that you have uh, been exposed to it, can over the period of a year, as was shown in uh, in Russia and India, where one was out of the ground, the other one was chemistry artificially created, can kill millions of people over the period of a year and more as you go from the first year to the fifth year is basically the time most people are are killed by uh, what is basically nuclear material exposed to the air and carried by a gas called radon uh, will in fact kill people. But the worst part of all of it is electromagnetism. That a magnet, which is basically the core of the earth, can be helpful in space, creating a wall that blocks off um, sun activity, solar activity, that would, in fact, prevent life on Earth if it could reach Earth at its full uh, blast. Um, the field of magnetism blocks that activity, and therefore life is possible on Earth. However, if you are too close to the electromagnetic field and you read Michael uh, Faraday's work, you know that what you have is that magnetism that draws the cell of the body and uh, creates all kinds of physical problems which the cell considers reduces a lifespan from its normal length, which, which, which should be about 120 years, down to about 80 years or less for most of the people. And, and all of it is dependent upon this magnetic field which uh, you don't smell, you don't hear, you don't see, but is having an effect on your body over time. Alzheimer's being what I believe to be the ultimate destruction of the human being by destroying its memory capabilities of the brain and the backup uh, memory, which are located as glands in the areola area of the breast. Right, and that's what so they do with like antiperspirants and stuff. Have a uh, zinc oxide in it, which is basically like an aluminum. Yeah. That, that conducts electricity in your brain. That's you know. Yeah. And what about and all if the you look at the water too? in the country? There is. A, a sufficient amount of iron in the water, uh, and and you see it because you have to clean toilets constantly and, and sinks where they build up a yellow residue uh, where the water pours out, uh, which is basically rust. Right. So, so also, you're, and you're, you're piping in your, your home, right? You're ingesting all that iron. All the stuff that, and that's one of the most con, conducive materials, right? Iron, very yeah. copper. One of the copper, things copper. that happens in the country like we are is um, every now and then there's a power failure. And if there's a power failure, then your sump pump doesn't work. And if it happens during a storm, water rises and enters the basement of houses, no pump operating, therefore it flows onto the floor, 
Well, it's not like the city where you're getting all this sewage coming in because it's clean water. But as soon as the pump comes on and the water gets pumped out, you feel relieved. You know, it's it's gone and everything is back to normal. However, all of the rugs and carpets you have on the floor in the basement have, in fact, absorbed the iron that is in the water. Right. And over time, like here we've had floods three or four times in the basement, over time that must have an effect as part of the magnetism. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, to make a long story short, <laughs> if that's possible, um, I turned the patio stone over and pulled it out of its place and began to look at it uh, from the underneath side being turned on top. And what I got was basically a story that starts uh, with crystal and moves on to um, show triangles, um, gores, male and female, like the Star of David, uh, Mm -hmm. if they were put together, uh, a tin can, old tin can with the rim uh, undone off of it, which basically suggests the container, which is a human body, with the two triangles of male and female going into the container, Um, and I don't want to go into the whole story because it'll take me two hours to say, (laughs) you know, what's, what's in there, but it comes out to the story of human beings starting as crystal, which is the deepest product in the earth, basically under tremendous pressure, um, it has um, manufactured crystal, which is the process through which diamonds are made eventually. And the concept of Earth is that the center core of, of the Earth itself, which is... 6,400 kilometers uh, down to the center um, has in the center part a furnace based on electromagnetism and is 3,000 kilometers in radius from the core to the edge of the mantle. And that one could imagine the center as a diamond, a singularity from which everything else extends out. And this stormy uh, furnace going on all around it is basically manufacturing crystal. In the story of Uh, the Caucasian, it begins with uh, a story of a guy called Jesus Christ, Christ being crystal. Mm -hmm. So you start off with a crystal and you manufacture a situation which leads to a crucifixion. That is the story that is implanted in this patio stone. <laughs> wow. Broken into pieces, I was able to see a more complete story because 
hidden within the rock itself uh, are things like uh, the nails for the crucifixion, the filament wire for working magnetism through the system. Now, why would anybody build a patio stone to put a filament wire, something like you would have in a light bulb, right. through the rock? Unless they're telling a story. And blood, um, obviously some kind of red paint, poured on certain parts that would seep into cracks which would match what was required in the story, that kind of stuff. So that's where my journey underground began um, and going approximately 10 feet under the house finding these stones with markings on them that could be geographic or could be uh, physical, dealing with the human body, the skull, and and uh, footprints. Hard to tell which one was intended, but they, they can look the same, of different colors, um, and then a softball-sized rock, which is uh, uh, white rock. In Canada, I only know of one place called White Rock, and it's in British Columbia. The last place one goes through to get to the United States. In in the state called Washington, near Seattle, the last place in Canada is called White Rock. So it kind of hints at the use of White Rock has something to do with telling you that you're on the border. You're on the edge of something or other. Right. Continuing with the the digging through the clay and sand and whatever mostly clay it it certainly can't be shoveled you have to break it off um, at about nine feet from the wall I came across a pattern of rocks leaning on the ceiling or the underside of the floor, basement floor, and started picking away at at the clay around it. Um, the structure was a baseball-sized rock, a flat rock, resembling the plate in baseball uh, and on top of that a larger rock with white markings on it about the size of a football and as I was digging away it fell out hit me in the arm kind of hurt me for five, ten minutes. Um, but I was able then to to push it aside and roll it out. Uh, but what occurred at the exact moment that rock fell on me, gravel started pouring out of the floor, leaving a space between the bottom of the floor, which is where I was under the house, and the actual floor in the house, basement floor in the house, the cement foundation. And at first, it struck me like um, this is a hiding place. But as it emptied, 
There was nothing there but gravel. Hmm. And the only thing that held the gravel in place was the big rock was pointy kind of at the top, which meant when it was on the ground and they poured cement, say about half an inch of cement for the foundation, this rock would have been sticking up and they would have put gravel around it and then poured the rest of the cement to make the floor. And this gravel would not receive cement, so it would be loose, but had no right. place to go because it was being held in place by the top of a big rock, and the big rock couldn't move because it was on a flat rock, and the flat rock couldn't move because it was on a round rock, and the <laughs> entire thing was encased in in clay. But as it emptied, and I'm always very conscious of... Uh, booby traps because that's the habit they used to have in the Middle East is everything is booby trapped and and the guy who paid Carter to excavate um, Tutankhamun's tomb uh, was the first guy to enter Tutankhamun's tomb and he died shortly thereafter they say, from a mosquito bite. Well, I'm pretty sure the mosquito goes to the mosque on Friday night. <laughs> it's more Muslim than mosquito. Um, an assassin probably did him in. But there's also the possibility that um, there was something in the space, and if you stick your hand up, you might get caught or something. The whole floor might collapse or whatever, I don't know. So I was very leery. And then I kind of laid on my back and was looking at this hole, and it matches what appears to be the skulls or footprints on the other bigger rocks that I had taken out. And seems to be tied to a, a message. The white rock saying you're close to something. The footprints or skulls would say there's something here that is not natural. And I kept looking at it, and then the cell came over, and they were taking pictures of, of everything uh, so that there would be a record off the property of everything that I was looking at. And they said... You know, you're nine feet in, including the wall, and the Ark of the Covenant weighs 89 pounds. And that could mean nine feet in, eight feet down. And at this stage of the game, I'm about, say, four to five feet into the, into the dig from the floor. But why would they put a um, space at one place in the floor basically nine feet from the outer wall, eight feet from the inner wall, in the basement where I slept for five years and you spent a few nights down there. Um, 
And I I told Jennifer to go in the basement. I was going to tap on the on the ceilings for me and the floor for her and tell me exactly where that was. And sure enough, when she went into the house and down the basement looked at it and I tapped, it came to be right at the foot of the bed. (laughs) Now, they said, if there's an Ark of the Covenant or something derived from the concept of the Ark of the Covenant, Located in the ground, it would be eight feet down, nine nine feet in, eight feet down, 89 pounds is the message. Our address on the door is 908. Everything kind of matches that maybe in that hole is an electromagnet. Is it the Ark of the Covenant, or is it a model of it, or something natural, or whatever? It's suggested to me by the cell that whoever built the foundation is not the same persons who built the house. They're two separate teams. And that's the story of the temple. In Israel, Solomon builds the temple. But he does it with the help of cedars of Lebanon that are brought in by the king of Tyre on a foundation already built by his dad, David. And in the temple, you have basically four separate spaces. At the door of the temple, on the patio outside, is where people brought their donations. Sometimes it was food, and sometimes it was money or jewels or whatever. But priests at the doorway had to make a decision on whether um, it should be brought into the temple. Now, if the meat was filet mignon, it would be brought into the temple. But if it was hamburger, it would be barbecued at the door and called burnt offering didn't qualify to enter the temple. If it was gold, it would enter the temple, and whatever was required to run the temple was used, and any surplus um, coins would be put in a box. And one priest had permission to enter the third space, which was called the Holy of Holies. So when you walk into the back room with the treasure, he had a chain and pulley system set up, which would raise a rock from the floor large enough to walk into and go down into the Holy of Holies. Upstairs was the Holy, downstairs Holy, Holy, and lay the box with gold or jewels or whatever down there. What he didn't know is that there was a holy of holy, holy, (laughs) Holy built by his dad, which is a room under the room, 
so that when things were put in the Holy of Holies and it, only one priest was allowed to go in there, and of course it was um, so um, um, uh, what would the word be so uh, secure by the fact that only one priest could go in there that a rope was tied to the priest's ankle when he went into the holy or down into the holy of holies in case he died while he was in there they could pull the body out yeah. and appoint another priest to go do that particular task what he didn't know is there was a movable rock in the floor that David could go in after he had left and steal some of the wealth that was being hidden in the Holy of Holies. Now, that period in time was from um, approximately uh, 1000 B.C., to 586 B.C. So you have a period of 416 years where this process goes on. Burnt offerings at the door, uh, treasure brought inside, the most valuable being taken into the holy, down into the holy of holies, the uh, less valuable use for daily operation, and the treasure would build and build and build, but never seen by anybody except the one priest that had the right to go down there. So as they died and another one was replaced, he wouldn't know if there was something missing. The, the new guy didn't, didn't have a record of the things that were brought down there. And that's exactly like the nuns operate in the Vatican, is the priests go out and bring back treasure and information and stuff like that and put it in the archives, but they don't want to do the bookkeeping. So the nuns come in and do the bookkeeping. But the nuns can be pilfering at the same time and taking out information that eventually the people who are there in charge have no knowledge of. And yet the nuns have knowledge of it. And that's how genetic engineering made its way from the Vatican into monasteries where uh, nuns began to build a foundation for their control over the world called foundlings. And foundlings are babies that have been genetically modified, and over thousands of years that modification gets tweaked occasionally, so that each child born is task-specific. Starting off with nasty barbarians uh, at the beginning and ending up with civil servants who do what they're told at the end. And these intake people in governments and, and corporations really control the information that management gets and therefore can call the information to keep certain information away from management. And if you do that over thousands of years, you can infiltrate every operation that exists, whether they be government, corporations, 
hospitals, school boards, whatever, with what today we call women or a number 10 on the scale of uh, 1 to 6 is life on earth and tasks on earth. 7 is the place where you change things, you alter things, and then 8 being males, 9 being females, and 10 being women. But in poker, you know, they talk about 7 come 11. So the 8, 9, and 10 have disappeared, and then they're working on the final product, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Mm -hmm. and 16 would, in fact, be a new generation of human beings made for space exploration. So all of the information put together according to the cell, is okay. Something got hidden underground. A foundation away from the house for a new house was built in 1972. This is where something was built. And over the top of it was put a floor. And before the floor, markers as to how to get to certain places. If one were to want to retrieve this uh, hidden whatever, one would normally have to be spotted digging outside of the structure like I did. Mm. And more than likely using a heavy-duty machine if you don't want to spend a year doing it. However... Should you want to do it without anybody seeing you, you make sure there are no occupants in the house. You know the spot exactly by measuring eight foot in from a particular wall marked out by another code. And you arrive at a point on the floor that with a sledgehammer you can break. And then dig down uh, eight feet, attach a uh, lifting pulley system to whatever is down there, and lift it up into the basement of the house. Now, obviously, the size of the item uh, would determine whether or not you could get it out of the basement or if you would have to, say, set the house on fire. Now, the fact that this house is prefab and there is no plaster walls anywhere basically means if you lit the house on fire, it would burn to the ground. All you would have is the floor in the basement from where you can retrieve what the Bible calls... um, unaffected by fire or water. And the fact that you have laid underground a number of rocks that have a mineral content of iron, starting with gravel all around the house and uh, magnetism being uh, brought around the mode of transmission being water until it enters a capture system such as a cabling of hydro wires and telephone wires to affect things in the house, the heat of a fire could in fact create the necessary heat 
on the rocks that they would explode. There are a number of uh, uh, examples around the world during World War II when Mm -hmm. carvings, large carvings in uh, rock blew up when there was a bombing and a fire because they contain iron and iron expands or contracts at a different rate than granite and since it can't get out of the rock it does exactly what you get in a volcano the heated rocks which are a combination of iron and granite and stuff, basalt, are coming up the volcano. Mm -hmm. They hit the top and build up pressure. On top is usually a lake because volcanoes have, in fact, blown up years before and then stopped blowing up, and that creates the the bowl shape that is on top of a mountain that's a volcano and the heat builds up below it and all of a sudden there is a piercing between the rocks below and the lake above and the water coming down cold water hitting the hot rocks cause them to explode and right, right. depending on where the weak spot is, it will either blow the side out of the mountain, like Mount St. Helen, or blow the top of the mountain, like Vesuvius. Yeah. yeah. That is exactly the structure that we see here. And in asking the cell, why here? They said because it is to be the site of the next temple. There will be, and and we've been talking about this for five, six years now, a World War III, which I believe is being begun now with the concept of ISIS, and we'll build and build and build until it becomes nuclear, and the Middle East will be destroyed by nuclear bombs from Pakistan and Iran and North Korea and Japan and and Israel and Jordan and Syria and what have you. And therefore, this site, which has an address 908, and number two is number one, so you have to flip the zero out of its position. And the fact that it's read from uh, right to left in the Middle East is zero um, eight nine. And that makes it 89 pounds, just like the Ark of the Covenant. And the fact that the temple grounds in Jerusalem occupy a space of 34.2 acres, which is exactly the same thing as here, um, suggests that this place has been chosen by nuns to be the home of genetic engineering in a larger context um, based on Norse mythology, where on one side you have the military known as In Her Jar, and then you have Valhalla with uh, uh, Odin running the show for defense of the system, the political gang, and beside it, the women genetically engineering the bodies that will be used for space travel. 
which, of course, has to be three and one, like the toonie. It looks like a woman, strong like a man, but is run by a computer communications technology system whose headquarters is the Moho discontinuity. So they, the men think they're going to be in charge by being hidden inside the structure. The women think they're going to be in charge because they are the outside rim of the structure of the walking new bodies. Uh, but in fact, technology, um, artificial intelligence is in charge. Yeah. Computers learning from computers in the upper mantle of the earth as they explore the universe. And nobody knows. Uh, eh? <laughs> and nobody knows. And nobody knows. And and creation is saying it's beyond the time where this gang can be helped. And therefore, you have to find those people who will lead the exodus from the fourth dimension to the fifth dimension, and that's what our job is. Seven billion people are alive today on the planet. Seven billion people have lived and died here on the planet. Not an accident. The number is seven. Two sevens is the number used by the insurance industry and the medical profession. One seven is uh, uh, James Bond, double O seven. The right to murder a single individual is the mafia's job. Mm -hmm. The medical industry can murder um, large groups of people known as gene pools. And government is part of that team. And finally, um, the police and the military are three sevens, which means they can kill everybody and anybody. And therefore, their mentality has to be uh, tweaked upon each birth of the same person's DNA each time to cleanse it of those things that make them human and add things that make them fascist. And that's why you keep seeing these pictures on TV about policemen in uh, places like St. Louis and uh, other places acting totally without regard to humanity yeah. and acting simply like robots in charge. Yep. Oh, it's the same as and if you have course, a... In the U.S., black people are the first ones to suffer the consequences because fascists are brown nosers. <laughs> but in the end, they don't care. If they're not fascists, they're not on their team and therefore have no right to live. And right now, they operate as border guards and are only allowing certain gene pools to become citizens of the country so that they can fit in the jobs they have planned for them 
in in medicine in governments in the media uh so that the power of the fascistic controller lives on and that's a warrior mentality not debating for their own purposes whether it's right or wrong just it's orders yep we go out and we do what we're told to do so the cell suggests that this property if handled properly and a temple is built this one underground as opposed to um, a mountain top um, can be the last chance for humanity provided that a an instruction level by those people who will guide the exodus will take the time to tell the people who are left behind the opportunity they have to mend their ways and be saved or be left behind to live this life as um, servants of masters they never get to meet. So is that what we're doing? Then the exodus begins. Is that kind of starting now with every person we meet? It's kind of, yeah. we give them the chance Yeah. what we present. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Even Hydro and Bell and those people that have caused most of the problems, the World Health Organization, the World Wildlife Fund, who's out to kill uh, wildlife and have mild life instead. (laughs) All of those people are to be given an opportunity by the year 2020, I suspect. That's when you see clearly. And they choose the road they will take while we then choose uh, to lead the march to the fifth dimension, the exodus, leading all of those seven billion people who've died and did not participate in the criminal activity to kickstart a new universe. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And the number of people in this uh, final team um, is dependent upon their actions now and what they do now and when they arrive at creation's door which is called purgatory purgatory to the religious people um, the group will be larger than the number needed but creation itself will make the final decision as to who will occupy a seat in this new universal cabinet, if you will, and lead the group out while the other ones will come along but not be part of that leadership. It all depends upon task orientation and... Uh, lack of hypocrisy. Yeah. Those are what I understand to be the keys to the choices of the cabinet, the eventual cabinet.
In other words, hypocrisy is run in a human being on two levels, an ego and a super ego. An ego is practicing what others expect of you in order to disguise who you really are or practicing what you're told to do by the superego, which is subconscious, and you act out a role that you are ordered to do by an unknown controller. The real you is the id. And the id stands for ID, identification. The real you is one who was manufactured by creation and modified, tweaked by creator and realized that it had occurred A person then goes about the process of cleansing themselves of the tweaking of their DNA instructions and begins to live again and, and think like an original human being and not a hypocrite. Got to remember that Christian Church, the Vatican, began by two cities in North Africa called Hippo, sending their people, and the Hippo is the model of the hypocrite, and Augustinian Augustus, the first pope came from Hippo, and medical people must take a Hippocratic earth, uh, Hippocratic, hey? Oath. Oath, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. People have every opportunity to hear the story three times. And then make a decision on who they really are. Most people will not respond because they have bought into their program. Hang on a second, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm back. Welcome back. So, thank you for your assistance, and uh, uh, it's uh, much appreciated, but not uh, a uh, a necessity uh, to help out, uh, although we are and I speak on behalf of the chickens and the cats and the uh, goats, we are much appreciative of your help. It's made life a little easier. I was told a long time ago when I was on Parliament Hill that the reason newspapers cost money uh, is uh, to assure people that what they were buying was worth something. Getting it for free is uh, uh, basically somebody saying the value of what I'm giving you is worth nothing. And 
in discussing that with the cell, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, there would be a price for our time to explain things, and that price would be two dollars. Okay. A two D, which then would be drowned. The toonie being the symbol of the three in one space exploring a robot they want to build. And therefore, uh, a tub uh, filled with magnetic water was placed out in front of the garage, and each one through a toonie in it. And it's right beside a large number seven, which basically means a permanent change about to occur. Yeah. Well, I don't know how long I can keep it up, but for the time that I can, I like to help out whenever I can. You know, it might not be the same every time, <laughs> but it's the least yeah, I can whatever do. Whatever for... <laughs> you do is appreciated, but remember, it's not the reason for oh, I know. your participation. Oh, right. No, I know. I mean, I've been talking to you for years now, so... Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it's been years, but... Right? So. Nine. Yeah. Almost six years talking to you, so <laughs> and we just started paying now. <laughs> oh. But you know, no, I think it's the least I could do. You know, if I could help out, I could spend a hundred dollars on bullshit here, right? So yeah, I'd rather. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's happened. So on a night out, I could spend something like that, and that's not. I'm not really. I'm not getting the same kind of... Nothing that we talk about is secret. (laughs) You have the right to repeat it to anyone who will listen. Who will listen? (laughs) Yeah, you, uh, you don't repeat it personally to an individual who doesn't want to hear. You're, you have a, an obligation to tell them once. Uh, on occasion, tell them twice. But tell them three times and you're nagging if yeah. they don't want to hear. Yeah. I heard a good analogy. It's like if, you know, if someone's, you know, it's 3 a.m. and you walk into someone's bedroom with a flashlight and you shine the light in their face, they're going to get angry and mad at you, right? <laughs> You're waking yeah. them up. Like, they don't want to be woken up, so. Yeah. Good analogy. I also remember the one you said, don't argue with people who are drunk, you know, even of politics, yeah. religion, or, or anything, you know. So. Yeah. Got to remember that. That's a good one. Yeah. I don't really, it's kind of, I don't necessarily go into the whole um, premise with them. I'll just my answers to whatever they're asking, or the way that I answer, or, you know, um, exchange in the conversation will be grounded in the premise. So I don't necessarily I don't necessarily explain everything start to finish, unless they start really wanting to know something. But I kind of just my responses are all grounded in, you know, the premise that I discuss. Yeah. And stuff. Well, you're uh, uh, kind of a uh, outlier messenger from the farm, and uh, <laughs> passing on the word uh, to people who wouldn't otherwise get a chance to at least reflect upon the possibility is is important. Right. Yes. Yeah. What we 
can do. I got to go uh, because it's going to be dark in a few minutes, and I got to do my final run around yeah. the animals. So we'll be in touch again when you call. I'm All not right, always Glenn. able to answer if I'm under digging, <laughs> okay. but at least I know you called. But you're actually under your foundation now, or you're just on the side of the foundation? You're actually underneath? I'm under the foundation. <laughs> wow. All right. I was just picturing it in my head. So Did you just say you were knocking? Yeah, in the generally? basement. Yeah. Wow. In the basement at the foot of the bed. Right, yeah. By the stairs, kind of, right? That side? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, and I probably have uh, before I I can get down to eight feet under uh, I would have it about another four feet uh, and it will probably take about uh, four months about a foot a month to dig out and carry out the dirt in in pails that I can lift. And clay is very heavy, right? Yeah. Uh, when it's wet, <laughs> and uh, so about a month, uh, a foot a month, to make enough room in a hole that I can turn around in. Okay. And if uh, if I do find uh, an electro magnet down there, then the possibility is of getting electrocuted uh if if uh one of the possibilities of booby trapping is correct well your but, rubber boots yeah i'm i'm uh i accept the fact that i am being injured every day by magnetism as i proceed to do this but only I had enough of the information to make that uh, possibility secondary to saving the universe, if we can. Saving the people of the universe, if we can. The universe is pretty well done. As the three universes that came before it were done, and if uh, you look at it as planets, the uh, planet Mars used to be much the way Earth is today. And Earth will be much like Mars at some time in the future and Venus will take over as the planet from Earth as the oh. sun gets smaller and smaller and then uh, eventually goes through a supernova where it then turns into a black hole and attracts everything into it again. maybe to explode out at another place at another time. Maybe we could talk about this on the next call, but the difference between a, the universe and galaxies is what? What's... Yeah. Okay, Danny. I got to run before yep. another 15 minutes goes by. <laughs> okay. All right, have a good one. Uh, say hi to Jared for us. I will. Say hi to Jenny. <laughs> yeah. Bye for now. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.